Hey there, and welcome to Main Street Living. I'm Cheryl Nelson. Hey, I'm Quincy Carr. And I'm Danielle Alvari. Uh, Cheryl, uh, welcome back. No, <laughs> thank uh, you. <laughs> you know, Danielle, um, she took over something that I thought I was supposed to have in your place, you know, but while I was gone the week before that, she was there with you and then you were gone and then I'm getting excited and you took the tag away from me, Danielle. Is there a reason? <laughs> it so had wait, to be done. What we're talking it had about. to be done. Can you explain what, what tag she took away? Well, you know, I wanted to say we'll take a stroll on Main Street to end the show because that's your thing. And you told me I could have it before the end, before you left the week before. So well, I just want to try it. Well, oh, you tried man. it. man. I, I feel like the mother of the show and I, I wasn't here to, to manage everybody. So Q, all I can say is I'm sorry for each their own. <laughs> five, five days, five days. You guys I'm are holding so on funny. To that one. But I have to tell you what my neighbors and I found last night. I am a huge animal lover, as you guys all know. Mm -hmm. And I want to put up this picture here because this, look at that. Oh, Cheryl! It's a baby mink, this? a baby ah. mink. Okay. So minks are in the same family as otters and weasels, for example, they're semi aquatic and they are super tiny. And so this little guy was actually found along a shoreline of a river just by himself squeaking in the cold. Wow. And so my neighbors jumped into action. There was no mother, no other siblings around scooped up this little one and put it, as you can see there, on a, it's like a, a rice pack that you heat in the microwave. It's in a sock to keep it warm. And then they were also holding the mink by their chest for that body heat. Because when you find wildlife like that in need of help, don't disturb it unless you clearly see that it needs help right. or the family might not be around. And if you do, first thing you want to do is warm up that baby's body temperature. So important. Oh. You want to do that before you try to feed or give water. But um, yeah, it's so amazing. And I contacted a local wildlife rescue and they were able to transport the little mink there. And I'm happy to say that the mink baby is doing well. Oh, oh Cheryl. Yeah. You started us off with a really heartwarming story. <laughs> I love that. It makes me so happy. And I'm glad they called because they didn't know what to do. So yeah. um, everybody look up Wildlife Rescue in your area so you know what to do if you find one. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I'm <laughs> keeping it, Cheryl. Let's be honest. <laughs> no, oh, man. <laughs> All right, guys. So we have a busy show today. And this is something that may be difficult to talk about. But if you or a loved one is battling cancer, mm -hmm. we're going to share some important information. That's right. Um, and we're also going to have a musician that shows his passion for growing coffee on the show as well, too. We love that. We also have a, a talk with a child psychologist coming up. And we're going to get to hear from a very special storyteller about 30 days of gratitude and giving back in good deeds. It's a great way to start the show. So stick with us right here on Main Street Living. Welcome back to Main Street Living. Guys, with everything going on in the world, everybody loves a good story, right? <laughs> yes, and I think right now more than ever, it's important to focus on how our stories can unite us, bring us together, reveal simul similarities. Our next guest uncovered the power of a personal story after seeing the response to a blog she started for Ramadan a decade ago. Please welcome award-winning storyteller and author of 30 Days, Stories of Gratitude, Traditions, and Wisdom, Salma Hassan Ali. Salma, thanks for joining us on Main Street Living. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Now, of course, we want to dive into your blog and your book, but first, we are in the month of Ramadan, and many non-Muslim Americans may not have a good understanding of what Ramadan is and what it stands for. Can you give us a little bit of an overview? Yes, absolutely. Ramadan is the month of fasting for Muslims, uh, and that means that from dawn until sunset, we don't eat or drink. We try and be our uh, best selves. Uh, it's, it's very much about fasting, but it's also about being charitable and doing good deeds and being extra kind and compassionate and really 
understanding how blessed we are and how important it is to care for our neighbors. I like that. And it looks like you've been doing that for a while. We're talking 10 years ago, you started a blog to share stories with your friends and family during Ramadan. Um, tell us why you started and, you know, and how has it grown since then? Yes, absolutely. So it was Ramadan 2011 and my kids were young. They weren't fasting at the time, but I wanted them to understand that this month is really special. Beyond not eating and drinking, there are certain values that are the essence of this month like doing good deeds and expressing gratitude and being uh, grateful and kind and compassionate and charitable. And so these are the values that I wanted my kids to understand. So that first year, it was uh, Ramadan 2011. Uh, we decided we would do one good deed each day, something small for our family, for our neighbors, within our community. And to keep us disciplined and focused, we would blog about it. Mm. Uh, and that's how it started. The blog became 30 Days, 30 Deeds. Nice. nice. I love that. And, and these themes you're talking about, expressing gratitude, doing good deeds, you know, preserving traditions. Would you say these are the kinds of things that you could kind of apply across any faith? Absolutely. This is not just the preserve of uh, Muslims or of Islam. These are values that are inherent in every faith tradition and really in every person who believes in compassion, in kindness, in community, in connection. I think that covers all of us. Yeah, so some of, you know, you decided to create this, this beautiful book and it has stories from a blog. Um, why did you decide the need for it, number one, and then obviously uh, when it became something that was tangible? You know, I think we are at an inflection point. We are emerging, hopefully, slowly out of the most challenging, most stressful, most painful year in all of our lives. Pandemic is something that we have experienced together. And we're at a point right now that I think we need to really connect with each other in a deep, meaningful way. And for me, it's through stories. I'm a storyteller and we each have to find our own way to uh, make a difference and to heal our society and our community and our world. Mm -hmm. and uh, I try and do that by sharing personal stories. I think they unite us, they connect us, they make us familiar, they uh, help us build a relationship with each other. And we can focus on what we have in common, which is so much. Most fundamentally, we are all human beings and our human stories bring that to light. Yes. They definitely do. Um, and you have to have an impactful story to share with us, just one piece of beautifulness that you can share with us. <laughs> I would love to. Um, one story that uh, certainly has a lot of meaning for me, it was during the year that we were collecting uh, 30 wisdoms from our elders. And this is something that my mom shared with me when I was young. I continue to think about it, share it with my own kids, and I'll read a little bit of it. Growing up, I was a quiet, reserved, fairly shy girl, happier studying than socializing. I wasn't one of the cool kids or athletically inclined, so doing well became my thing. I got used to getting straight A's until my sophomore year in college. I took astronomy to fulfill a science requirement, thinking it wouldn't be as challenging as the other science classes and would help me maintain my GPA. Then I got my first semester final exam back, a C plus. I was mortified. I, I came home that day. I ran upstairs to my mom's room. I collapsed on her bed, told her what had happened, that my GPA was ruined, my dreams crushed, my future dimmed. Yes, I was an overly dramatic 19-year-old. My mom listened calmly, not at all phased by my histrionics. And then she said, Beta, God has to sprinkle his favors on everyone. He can't make you good in English and history and math and astronomy. He has to be fair and make someone else good at some things. Wow. Wow. Yeah, that's <laughs> very impactful. Um, I know I didn't uh, cry when I made bad grades because that's what I expected <laughs> myself to do. So <laughs> I think that was very relatable. I think I think I had that moment as well. It was very much perfectionist. So but it can relate to everybody, right? Like not everyone can be good at everything. Um, and and that's the the I, I hope what the beauty of the blog and this book really is, is that it takes yeah. during Ramadan. 
Uh, the central characters happen to be Muslim, but these are stories that we can all relate to. We all have these experiences and we all want to do good and express uh, our gratitude. So these are human values that uh, we can see ourselves in and relate to through this book. Right, it's like you said, you have Ramadan, this time of year to take a moment and really focus on gratitude. And that's something we can all do, whether we are you know, Muslim or not. Um, so that's just something we can all take with us. What else do you kind of hope the book and the blog accomplish? You know, for me, it's really a, a call to action to have conversations within our families, uh, across generation, with our neighbors, mm -hmm. and with people who we may think at first are different from us. Uh, this book hopefully will encourage those conversations, you know, have conversations about things we can all relate to and talk about uh, and, and build those human connections and we'll take it from there. Such a great message during, during these times, of course. Um, and finally, uh, where can viewers go to go find more information about your book? Uh, it's all on my, web, my, on my website, and that's www.salmahassanali.com. There are just a few hundred of these books available. Each one has been handmade. It's a oh, wow. tradition. Uh, it has some beautiful art. So yes, please um, join me on my website if you're interested. Awesome. Thank you so much for being a part of the show. And thanks for sharing those inspirational uh, moments as well. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. No problem. All right, Danielle, uh, such great info. And uh, next, we're going to go ahead and switch some gears and uh, see a phenomenal musician who can perk you up, but with coffee. Hmm? <laughs> we'll be right back. Huge did there. Welcome back into Main Street Living. Now, uh, confession time. Uh, in between uh, our segments here, we have been having a lot of yawning today, but I will say that's normally me. It's normally me, but not today because I had time to make my coffee. Yeah. Me too. I got my coffee right here. It's almost gone. <laughs> Clearly, shots fired. Poom, poom. It's me. <laughs> it's me without saying it's me. But um, you might not know, ladies, um, as I ended the last segment, Jason Moraz. Okay, yeah, he's yeah. Uh, he's an incredible musician. He's had a great career, but to the San Diegans out there, I bet you did not know he's growing some of the world's finest coffee right there in San Diego. Ooh, yeah. So let's uh let's check out what he's growing. I started my career in coffee shops. That's standing in the corner, you know, trying to sing over a steam wand or an espresso machine or a burr grinder. And through my travels as an artist, I would dip into coffee shops all around the world and, and started to fall in love with the beverage itself. So I decided I would be more proactive with my trees and go organic and draw carbon down and be a better steward of the earth. Because for me, I felt like it was a good way to offset my music travels. We are in Oceanside, California, and we are a subtropical fruit farm. We grow 11 different varieties of coffee, and we are the producer of the coffee cherry, which is the very first step in the entire process to get a great cup of coffee. Every single tree requires a human to be visiting it weekly. We have about 2,400 coffee trees in the ground here on this farm. Of those 11 varieties, there are a few that are sought after. One specifically, probably the most sought after coffee in the world is the Geisha variety, which originated in Geisha Village, Ethiopia. The Moraz family farm, it's the first farm in San Diego County to produce a Geisha. The farm is truly a project of love. I'll be honest with you, the best coffee typically is grown at the highest elevation. And the reason for that in that high altitude is it gets colder up there and it causes that cherry to slow down its ripening process. What we lack in elevation, we make up for because we have winter. It's a mild winter, we're in a subtropical region, so we only get to about freezing, but it's not enough of a winter to kill the plants and harm the fruit. So where we don't have altitude, we have latitude. And that latitude allows California, by sheer accident, be a specialty coffee producer. This one would probably be delicious. Geisha has a reputation for its flavor. This, this silky smoothness that goes along with it. It also has a reputation 
uh, on the marketplace because historically it has always been the most expensive cup of coffee. I mean, last year's Best of Panama sold for over $1,000 a pound. And that, my friends, is just the green finished bean. So this would be the geisha variety. And this would be a natural. That's why there's a little bit of reddish color to it. The seeds are almost canoe shaped. They're oblong and they're narrower. Once the roaster gets involved, they take that green bean, they add heat, the bean explodes. It loses half its weight and it doubles in size. And through the roasting process, that little green bean becomes that beautiful chocolatey coffee bean that everyone recognizes. If you get a California Geisha, you're drinking one of the rarest coffees in the world. I love being a steward of the earth and seeing what happens when you plant a tree and give it love. It's very much the same in any business or creative endeavor where you plant an idea and you water it, you nurture it, and then over the years you see what it grows into. We're here on Earth for a limited time. It's a miracle that we're even here, have consciousness, and it's a real luxury and an honor to be able to spend my time with these sentient beings. All right, guys, I've always heard that the best coffee is grown at high elevation, but I did not know it was because of the temperature. Cheryl, you should, I mean, where were you on that? Right, I know, we learn something new every day. That's so cool. Weather plays a role in so much more than we know, doesn't it? Yeah. All right, guys, well, switching gears a little bit, coming up on Main Street Living, when you're in need of medical care, how do you know where to go? If you or someone you know is battling cancer, we have some important information for you next. Hey guys, welcome back to Main Street Living. Um, Danielle, Cheryl, no matter how focused we are on our health and wellness, of course, uh, sometimes illnesses still happen, right? Mm -hmm. I know, gosh. So if you or someone you love are one of the 1.8 million Americans who receive a cancer diagnosis this year, you want the absolute best treatment available. And luckily, cancer treatments are getting more effective. And we have a doctor here today from one of the country's top cancer centers. And we want to welcome Dr. Lisa Perry from Moore's Cancer Center at UC San Diego Health. Good to see you. Thank you so much for joining us today on Main Street Living. Thank you for having me. Now, doctor, lifestyle choices are responsible for an estimated 50% of cancer deaths in the United States each year. This is astounding to me to hear this. So what are some lifestyle choices people can make to lower their cancer risk? Yeah, so the number one thing we can all do is if we're smoking is to quit smoking, um, which is hard to do. We all know it, it is a very addictive to be smoking, but we know we can get help and and teach people ways to quit smoking. And there's lots of resources out there and that would help be a good place to start. Also other things that we know can help with our cancer risk is um, alcohol consumption and um, weight. If we are an active can also be things that can and contribute about 18% can be a cause of cancers. Hmm. So it, to give us a better lifestyle, to exercise, this would also help us to do, um, to get healthier and help us with health, like heart disease and other diseases as well. For sure. And in this last year, it's been hard for people to stay active because a lot of us have not been able to go to gyms or things like that. So we're starting to get back at it. Um, wanted to go back really quick to the smoking thing though. You're including vaping and all of that in there as well, right? Because that's very popular, Correct. especially with younger people now. Yeah, so vaping yeah. also included there, guys. Um, so take those preventative measures, but you can still you can still get unlucky and receive a cancer diagnosis. What things should a patient look for when choosing a cancer center? You know, at UCSD, I feel like we're good at, one, we, tr we know it's not just the cancer. We're, mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. Cancer diagnosis we see as unique and each patient's unique and the cancer diagnosis is unique. And so we treat each patient individually and that's our biggest 
our biggest um, picture, picture. Mm -hmm. we also know health and mental health is important. So we have gardens and we treat the whole patient with um, yoga and classes to really give the patient peace of mind and support groups um, to help the whole patient. Our nurses are very good at listening to the patients and also um, giving them guidance. And so I, I really feel like UCSD were the whole team approach, like a multidisciplinary team and really help the patient. And you're not just seeing one doctor, you're not just seeing an oncologist, you're seeing surgeons, radiation oncologists, the whole team is going to look at your cancer and help you figure out the best approach for you. And I'm glad that you mentioned mental health as well, because this takes such a toll on a person when they are trying to battle cancer. So you're doing so many good things. And also Moore's Cancer Center, I hear that it's San Diego's only comprehensive cancer center. What does that mean to you? So to me, it means that we treat more than 200 cancers and all subspecialties. And we um, see a lot of patients and we see a lot of um, cancers. So like our surgeons, one, are very well versed. So like, for example, our pancreatic surgeons may not do, they in other country or other centers may not do a lot of pancreatic surgeries, but here we do them every week. And mm -hmm. so you're gonna get the a high volume, lots like, lots of sir like lots of experience and um you're gonna get the best and also we are do a lot of research and so we're bringing a lot of our you know research to, to the forefront and helping patients get the best care yeah i know ucsd really known for its research um are there any specific types of cancer that you guys do specialize in we, I mean, we specialize in a lot of cancers. I personally um, am with the rectal cancers and colon and rectal cancers, mm -hmm. and we just got accredited a national um, national accreditation program for rectal cancer. Wow. Just showing that we're really on top of the standard of care and bringing the research to the forefront, and that you're going to get the best treatment. And we do a lot of rectal cancer surgeries and you're gonna be well taken care of. And I would feel very comfortable sending my family to UCSD. Are you finding that a lot of patients are traveling from out of state, far distances to come to your center? Yeah, I mean, I think a little bit, you know, COVID has been, as we talked about, very rough, um, but it's also given a lot of patients the access to see us and to do video visits and to really get care and to get treatment and get what, you know, our oncologists may recommend that may not be known in other centers. Mm, yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for, for all of your information today, Dr. Perry. We know you're very busy. Um, you have a lot to get to. So thank you so much for joining us on Main Street today and all of that great info. Thank you so much. All right. Stick with us because coming up, uh, don't tell Dr. Perry, but we're going to be making spicy margaritas. Don't go anywhere. Oh, no. <laughs> Welcome back to Main Street Living. I am super excited about this. Cinco de Mayo is right around the corner, and I am looking forward to the guacamole and the margaritas. I'm going to give up the water and have some margs that day. Okay, well, maybe you still have some water, Cheryl. Okay. All right. All in moderation, I know. Especially if you're going to be outdoors or anything. Um, but if you are planning to celebrate close to home this year, we can help you with the margarita part, at least uh, with this recipe that kicks it up a notch by adding some spice. Take a look. Hey everybody, my name is Holly and I'm from Seven Grand San Diego and today I'm going to be showing you how to make a spicy watermelon margarita for a single de Mayo. First, I want to show you the ingredients you need and how much of each. First, you're going to need some chamoy and tahine for the rim of your glass. Next, you're going to need um, three quarters of an ounce of fresh lime juice. You're going to need some cubed uh, seedless watermelon. You're going to need half an ounce of agave syrup 
half an ounce of orange liqueur. Today I have Cointreau, you can use triple sec. And also, uh, we infuse our tequila with jalapenos. You need an ounce and a half of that. So we're gonna make our cocktail. First, I said rub the glass, dip it in the chamoy, and then the tahini. Set that off to the side. Grab your shaker. First, we're going to do the watermelon. Throw about three cubes in there. And muddle your watermelon until it's like a smooth texture. Right. Next, you're going to do the lime juice. So that one is three quarters of an ounce. Then we have the agave, that was half an ounce. You can do more if you want it sweeter, but a half ounce is pretty good. Next is the orange liqueur, and that was a half ounce as well. Okay. And next for the uh, jalapeno infused tequila, you're gonna slice up at like four or five um, of the jalapeno, throw it in the tequila and let it sit for about five, 10 minutes. So you can get it however spicy you want it. So that was an ounce and a half. Throw that in your shaker. Next, throw your ice cubes in the shaker, and then we're gonna shake for about 10, 15 seconds. It'll be nice and bounced. Grab your glass, throw an ice cube in there, and then you are ready to go for the glass. All right, next we're gonna do the garnish. So I'm gonna do a little cube of the watermelon, throw it in there, and a lime meal. And that is a spicy watermelon margarita. I hope you have a fantastic Cinco de Mayo, and I hope to see you at 7 Grand soon. Oh, that looks so good. I am ready, and I got to get some of those spices. I know, and jalapeno and tequila? Yes. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah, uh, like, I'm a person I don't even drink like that unless I'm on a cruise ship and a passenger buys me a margarita. But <laughs> up next, something at least I can relate to, ladies. Uh, we're going to get some tips on parenting during the pandemic. Help. Welcome back to Main Street Living. All right, those of us who are parents, like you, Quincy, know that unfortunately, kids do not come with instructions, do they? No, they do not. <laughs> and uh, we can certainly use all the expert advice, Cheryl, that we can get. Uh, in fact, our next guest is a psychologist and expert on child development. And she's here with some pearls of wisdom about parenting during the pandemic. Welcome, Dr. Kara Goodwin to the show. How are you doing there, doctor? Hi, everybody. Hey there. Good to see you on the show. Um, just like Cheryl was mentioning, uh, parenting, well, for me, is very challenging at times. And then a global pandemic just kind of threw a twist at all of that. Yeah. Uh, it kind of messed us all up a little bit. But how have you seen parenting change during this past year? Yeah, that's a great question. So parenting during the pandemic, like you said, has gotten a lot more challenging. It's gotten very, um, even more intensive than it was before. You know, parents are expected to be their child's teacher, their child's social support, you know, their therapist, their playmate, you know, their <laughs> full-time chef. There's a lot of expectations on parents right now. Um, and as a result, we're seeing a big mental health toll in parents. So we're seeing a lot of anxiety and depression in parents. We're seeing, um, you know, even if not meeting criteria for the an anxiety disorder or depression, um, a lot of stress in, in, you know, pretty much universally across parents. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's definitely relatable for you. I know you have three children of your own. Um, yes. Are there any ways your parenting style has changed this past year that you think you'll decide to to adopt and keep? 
Yeah, definitely. So I think, you know, I've, I've noticed during the pandemic, you know, I've had, fortunately, my two of my kids are back in school, but I've had times Mm -hmm. where I've been at home with, with all three and it is so challenging. And I think the thing that's really helped me is to focus on gratitude, you know, finding the little things in the everyday that I can be grateful for. Um, And, you know, the research shows that gratitude helps to build resilience and really helps you um, to buffer, which means to prevent stress. Um, So I think having gratitude is something I will definitely take going forward. Um, Having self-compassion is something else that I think I've really learned from all of this. You know, none of us um, can be a perfect parent. And, you know, I at first was, you know, beating myself up thinking I have a PhD in child psychology. Why can't I homeschool these two kids? And, you know, just having some self-compassion that I, you know, teaching your own children is hard and um, being in in a pandemic and the stress that comes with it is hard. So I think um, I'll definitely bring forward, you know, self-compassion and, and accepting that I can't be a perfect parent. Yeah. Well, Quincy, what's that sign that's behind you say again? It says, I strive to be perfect, but end up being human. Okay. Yes. <laughs> and, and that is one thing that I had to remember uh, because you were talking about compassion and everything, doctor. And, uh, you know, our daughter was selling Girl Scout cookies. Uh, well, actually, we were selling the Girl Scout cookies, and I want a Girl Scout badge. I never got you mine, by the way. Work. <laughs> I want a badge for the Girl Scout cookies. But, you know, what kind of emotional and mental impact has the pandemic had on the kids? Yeah, so um, we are still figuring that out. You know, there isn't any research. Unfortunately, our kids are kind of the guinea pigs because this has never happened before. But, you know, what we do know is that there is increased um, mental health concerns in children. So anxiety, depression, stress, loneliness um, are what we're seeing. But the, the good news is that there are some things that we know that can help to prevent those negative mental health um, outcomes. So, you know, talking about the pandemic directly with your kids and, and the feelings that are coming up for you and the feelings that are coming up for them, um, trying to give them choices and control wherever you can. Um, there was a great research study that just showed that that can help to um, prevent some of the negative impacts. Um Helping your kids to, um, you know, deal with their emotions, giving them some coping strategies can really help. And um, more in a more basic way, just keeping your um, basic routines going and keeping some structure and some routines can also have a positive impact for children during this time. Sure thing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, is it something too that how are you able to talk to kids about it in a way that doesn't scare them, especially if they're really young children? Yeah, so you have to talk about it at an age appropriate level. So for young children, um, you know, I wouldn't be talking about a lot of the negative things of Mm -hmm. about the, you know, the pandemic, such as people dying, I would focus on, you know, that there's germs and how we can prevent Mm -hmm. it and, you know, focus on what we can do to control um, the experience rather than focusing on all the things that are out of our control. That's good advice for the adults, too, I think. Yes. Yeah, that's true. (laughs) Yes, it it very much is. And, you know, in fact, just before the pandemic hit, you actually started a website and a blog. Okay. yes. Uh, The Parenting Translator. Can you talk about that really quick before we go? Yeah. So, you know, as a child psychologist, um, I love reading the research related to parenting. And I, you know, have been reading the research and I really it occurred to me that, you know, the average parent, um, doesn't have access to this research and doesn't have the training to really digest it and, and doesn't honestly even have the time to really read it. So my goal is really to take the scientific research that's coming out every day and help to um, translate that into information that parents can understand and can make the job a little bit easier because, as you said, it is so hard. Yes. <laughs> yeah. where, where, can people find that, where can people find that info and, and those resources? Um, so I post regular regularly on my social media, which is at Parenting Translator. And I also post regularly on my blog, um, ParentingTranslator.com. And I'm uh, in the process of developing, I have two um, evidence-based guides for parents, and I'm in the process of developing some more that will be free downloads for parents that can cover kind of the hot topics in parenting. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Well, thanks so much. And- of course. And in the spirit of gratitude, we're really grateful that you joined us on Main Street Living. (laughs) Yes, well, thank you for having me. No problem. (laughs) All right, Quince, as you know, parenting, difficult for everyone, but can have its own set of unique challenges if you perhaps have a child with autism. So we're going to continue our coverage of Autism Awareness Month next.
Welcome back into Main Street Living. Uh, you guys, uh, we've been talking about this throughout the month. It is Autism Awareness Month and, and autism diagnosis for your child, it can be difficult and, and confusing for a lot of reasons. I know, and it's something that more and more families are dealing with as more children are being diagnosed with autism. But thankfully, there are some resources to help. Families for Effective Autism Treatment, or FEET, has chapters all around the country. And here's a look at what the group in Southern Nevada is doing. My name's Jennifer Strobel, and I'm the Executive Director of FEET of Southern Nevada, which stands for Families for Effective Autism Treatment. We are typically the first call local autism parents in Las Vegas make um, when they get that diagnosis of autism. Our parent mentor program is probably one of the most important things that we do. We literally handpicked seasoned families or seasoned parents that have their child in a good place. These parent mentors are familiar with feed services, community resources, funding, and it's really for an avenue for these families to connect with someone that has been there, done that, and have someone that they can just pick up the phone and call when they have a question or if they're having a bad day. I have a 12-year-old son who's on the autism spectrum. When Max was diagnosed with the autism spectrum disorder, it was a new experience for all of us. Nobody had ever heard of that, but it was first and foremost an educational experience. But it was very emotionally difficult because Max is the third of our children. He has two older sisters and uh, there's all sorts of expectations with uh, the only boy in the family, certainly as a father. I had expectations of playing sports and attending sporting events and suddenly those all seemed to wash away. Autism diagnosis affects an entire family, and that's the biggest misconception about this condition, is that it's not just individual to the boy or the girl, the adult. The impact can be across the family because you're dealing with behavioral issues that if you have more than one child, sometimes it's hard to explain to the other children why it is that your special needs child acts in a particular manner. The therapies can range from it's called Applied Behavioral Analysis Therapy, or ABA therapy, which is the main treatment modality, to speech therapy, occupational therapy, food therapy, recreational sports-related therapy. And my son has gone through all of that and continues to go through all of that. And the expense can be, quite frankly, overwhelming at times. During the early years in which he was receiving therapy, my son essentially was a second mortgage for us. I think that biggest misconception of autism is what people see on TV. You know, many people have seen the Rain Man movie um, or what they see in the news. Um, one of my favorite sayings is, is when you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. The best advice that someone ever gave to me for learning to live with a child on the spectrum is to truly live in the moment and appreciate the little victories and the little successes that my son Max may have. Oh, I love that. You have to celebrate the little victories, definitely. Oh my gosh, it's so true. And if you need help, advice, or just information about autism, find the FEET organization closest to you at FEET.org. That's right, Cheryl. A lot of good going on in this show today. And stick with us. We still have more of Main Street Living coming up next. Welcome back into Main Street Living. Guys, I'm glad we got to wrap up Autism Awareness Month. And that means that May is here, which means Cinco, Cinco de Mayo is almost here. <laughs> this year is going by so fast. This is, this is crazy. I, I, know. I, I know, but I'm hoping that more people can go out and at least have small gatherings this year, maybe some restaurants for Cinco de Mayo and, and do some things. I mean, obviously no big parties because of yeah. the pandemic, but it would be nice to just kind of gather with a few friends, especially if people are vaccinated, right? Yeah. Or furry mm -hmm. friends. It'd be, that'd be great if they were like mink friendly. I would love to bring my little mink with me to a oh restaurant. Oh my you know? gosh. 
I don't think I've ever seen a baby mink. I've never seen a mink before. Um, you know, in nature, they actually stay to themselves and they hide a lot. It's interesting. Yeah, That's well, great. It's cool that you were able to find them. So, and you can also find us on the go on our Cox Conto app. So, don't forget about that. And new episodes of Main Street Living Mondays at 9 p.m. local time. Join us next time as we take another stroll down Main Street.